Hey everyone, this is Manny from PhotoCare. I am joined by Gene Everett Such, where this is week two of uh, PhotoCare and Sony's video bootcamp series. Week two. If you didn't catch week one, we'll have it on YouTube in our uh, PhotoCare's YouTube channel. All right, so Gene Everett Such is a New York based filmmaker who has worked with many celebrities, politicians, and sport teams. Currently, he also serves as a regional trainer for Sony Digital Imaging in the New York metro area. He's been kind enough to give us his time to help us fellow Sony enthusiasts understand their cameras better. Today, we'll be going over a few things about how to basically set up your camera so to get the best image quality during video. Woo! <laughs> All right. Good times, man. Good times. Sure. <laughs> Oh, I, I forgot to tell you, I was going to, and, and by the way, welcome everyone. Thanks a lot for coming out to week two. It's great to continue this series and, and continue down this road. But yesterday I was making a dumplings and um, I accidentally burned, like severely burned my two fingertips. Oh, you wow. know, it's what happens when you have kids stepping over you 24 hours a day. And like, I cannot feel like, like the tips of my fingers right now because they're kind of like in shock. But like on the backs of the cameras, I've been trying to like, swivel the dials it's like is that right should it be doing that <laughs> so so i just took the paintings off and i'm like oh it's got a little indentation there of the pan and everything so it's all, all fun stuff so okay. probably more than you guys want to know but that's kind of my comment for the day <laughs> no, I'm glad but yeah okay. yeah i'm glad i'm okay too i'm actually not used to seeing you like without the curtain or something there it's like you're right in the middle of everything over there at photo care oh. <laughs> which actually it's cool depth of field but i'm like yeah. wow so are you are, are you like writing the store there or are you back in your well, area? I'm in the in the Zoom room. Oh, you're in the Zoom room. Okay. Yeah, All right. The, That's the awesome. Magic of Hollywood. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so screen. you got the green screen. I know I can yeah. see the fringe. I can yeah. see it. So see if maybe we could talk about that a little bit at some point too, because that is a cool green screen or <laughs> good background there. <laughs> but it makes me feel like I'm right there with you in uh, yeah. in Manhattan at twenty second street. Yeah. So just as a reminder, we are open. Everyone yes. is able to come into the store and shop and free to look around. Just please wear a mask. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but please do come in. They've got a lot of great products coming. Obviously, we announced a new camera today, the A7C, which is a comp, like yeah. almost like a compact, slightly updated version of an A7 III. We're not going to really talk about that today because, honestly, I think a lot of us are still digesting what's what's going on with it and um, the specs and when it'll be delivered and all that stuff. But that's just kind of a little bit of another great addition to the Sony Alpha mirrorless family that we get to talk about a little bit further down the road. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to certainly talk about, because I think uh, Manny and I have talked, we've seen a lot of the questions that you've been asking in regards to what you want to know and, and, and how we can help you out. I think we're going to start off by going through video settings and just to really make you feel a little bit comfortable. Um, Manny, just like myself, I'm sure a lot of the time, in addition to being you know, a photo sales associate and tech and social media. And, and he just, he does, does everything. He's like a rodeo clown. Um, basically we feel like a therapist because we're talking to you a little bit about specs and everything. So we're going to try to step you through a few things here and um, really just a touch base. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now because sure. I know that again, we're on limited time. So I have to kind of get my, get my stuff in order so that we get through whatever we, we plan on here. So and it, just to quickly recap, uh, I just want to highlight a few things. If you were here last week, that's great. If you're new, that's awesome. Thanks a lot for coming in. Uh, please keep sharing questions, anything like that. Manny and I are here. Um, obviously, this is kind of like our grown-up time, or at least for me, um, instead of being stay-at-home teacher or out filmmaking and shooting or you know showing off the ASMS3 or something like that, I get to do these classes. So remember, you can find all of the resources for SonyAlphaUniverse.com. Those are all things alpha. It's inspiration, education, especially in times like these where some of us are more confined than others um, and talking about some of our projects and just some of our successes and failures and all that fun. And you can also follow me at Gene underscore Everett on, not on Twitter, but on Facebook and YouTube channel and uh, Instagram. And I am doing some uh, Sony videos to kind of go deeper into kind of some of these, some of these tips and tricks that we're going to talk about, especially where video is concerned. Yeah. Just uh, before we start, sure. uh, everyone, uh, as you're watching along and you have questions, I'm sure you will, please answer them in the question and answer portal, the Q&A portal. That way we can keep track of them. And at the end of the presentation, we'll answer them. Okay. 
That's great. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for elaborating on that. Because we certainly, if we need to, I want everyone to feel like they're coming out of here, getting it and just, you know, getting something out of it. So a lot of what our cameras are known for and the new A7S3 and the A7 III are, are no exception, are known for the dynamic range of the sensor. So when we talk about that, we're also gonna talk about the latitude of the footage. So, you know, basically a sensor generates heat. It's a solar panel. So basically for sensitivity, that's kind of what funnels through the hits the sensor, goes to the processor, goes to the card, and there's your footage. So a lot of the time we're talking about it, we're talking about the latitude, which is the exposure flexibility of your captured image. Um, S-Log really came to power, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say come to power, but it started to be such a big resourceful tool for filmmakers, probably when the Sony, I want to say, yeah, it was the F65, probably it was a little bit before then, but the F5, F55, F65, you know, basically it was, it's, it's a really high um, impact gamma curve for film creators to pretty much have a lot of flexibility to capture a moving image and use it like you would a still image to capture a lot of those details, highlights, shadows, uh, as long as they're not burned out, of course, in your exposure and, and pretty much save them for post-production. What we're gonna do today is try to go through and talk about what are gonna be the best settings for your Sony cameras, whether you have an older version, A7 II, an A or an even A7 III, A7 R4, um, all the way up to the A7, you know, S3 or the S2. I mean, we're gonna to try to step you through that there can be universal practices here. We're not gonna go model specific. I mean, certain models of our mirrorless systems do a little bit better than others, but at the end of the day, this is videography and photography and rules are made to be broken. So that's what we're going to be here to do is show you how to break some rules. So first we're going to go beyond the dial. And, and Manny, this is, this is all about you. Yeah. So <laughs> and beyond the dial, we're going to talk about how to use the, the magical letter M for manual. <laughs> Everyone uses automatic mode, such as aperture priority, shutter priority. But when you're trying to create a look, you're trying to make something feel filmic or cinematic, you need to know what every mode does. Gene? Yeah, exactly. And I can't emphasize this enough. And one of the things that I have to emphasize that I think is maybe one of the turnoffs of people when they start to approach video is that much like when you take a camera out of the box, you're hit right up with program video, <laughs> yeah. which means basically the computer is metering your, the sensor is metering and you're programming. It, it, it's basically making all of these wonderful choices for you. When in reality, you should be doing that for yourself. Yeah. So one of the first things I really encourage you to do by getting out, out, of, the, out of your own self for a while, getting over yourself, I, People tell me to do that all the time. So that's the way I equate it here is to pretty much get beyond the P, get beyond shutter priority video, which as you know, is basically gonna take whatever shutter speed you put it at and then basically choose the aperture. And then aperture does reciprocal as far as changing the shutter speed for you for priority, which can make for some very interesting choices. So unless you're doing a lot of avant-garde video or just certain things <laughs> or trying to do the new wave, fine music video production, that's probably not something you want to do. <clears throat> Generally it leads to a lot of accidents and most of them are not happy, especially if you have a client involved. So what we want to do is inside of your camera's menu system, and usually it's on one of the first two pages, depending on the menu itself. I know if you have like what we have here, I mean, I have an A7S III right here. It's pretty much like right in front of you. It basically goes file format, boom, movie settings. All right, I'm going to be going into manual mode. So just like I teach my still photography students, I want to try to get you guys to understand exactly what we're talking about in order to get the images you want. Because you've got a system here that, yes, it is a Ferrari, <laughs> you know, in regards to technology. Uh, you don't want to put training wheels on too much onto it, but you want to understand exactly what you're doing and how you're doing it instead of just spraying and praying. So in regards to that, let's just talk about aperture really quick. This is a video still shot um, in, in log, actually not in log, it's a graded log. And I, basically you're seeing a nice portrait. It's very, very nice. This is what we would call shallow depth of field. 
So basically, this is when you're looking at a lens and going, you know, basically when people are telling you to go wide open. <laughs> and this is what you're, this is actually also what you're spending a ton of money for in the glass that you buy because everyone wants to make sure that you have, you know, clean backgrounds. It's so excited. And basically, if that, if that subject, if, if my background wasn't having that depth of field, you would see a nice little rusty fence back there that probably wouldn't lead to anything great and seeing lines going right through the subject. So that was shot actually at f2.8. Um, basically, it also helps out with you with the ISOs. So if you want to take cleaner ISOs, basically, you know, the, the, the film speed is going to be pushed down. So obviously, your signal to noise ratio is going to be a lot lower. So at ISO 100, you're going to get a lot cleaner image than you would say at 3200, which is where a lot of noise starts to kind of creep in and you're looking at artifacts coming near me. It's like, what's going on? And that's just a lot of the heat because your sensor is powering up. <clears throat> This image, if you had to take a guess, it, it, um, Manny, what, what did you guess would this be at? This is about, Ooh, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot easier yeah, be, either because F11? it can be kind of uh, close, very close, F8. Yeah, F8. so yeah, F8 and F11 are the sharpest points of any lens. And that's definitely where you're going to get that nice wider depth of field, but also get separation of subjects. So you've got nice foreground matter there, midground and background. So you can pretty much tell what's going on. So if we take, you know, say for example, if I wanted to roll this back at 2.8 and you're looking at a depth of field, obviously the stairs and the subjects moving up and even that shoved at the photographer standing in shadows really would not be that as crisp as you can possibly see there. So remember the larger the f-stop that provides the larger depth of the, the, the provides the depth of field. And also now, remember that uh, <laughs> f-stop and depth of field is relative to the length of the lens, the focal length. Correct. Do you want to go ahead and say something about so that? So if you're, uh, so people see um, a lens at f8 at 200 millimeters, you still got pretty shallow depth of field. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the, definitely the compression. The compression yeah. is absolutely there. It's definitely going to be hitting you a little bit. But those, but those are the pretty much the dark. Every time you move above f11, actually probably around f16, you're basically yeah. just, that's where your image quality yes. starts diminishing a little bit there. So, that, but I also, and that, I think we're going to be talking about that a little bit as far as your lens choices go in another session, because obviously people know well, what lens do I use in what certain types of situation. So we'll put some types of situational shots up and be like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. So shutter speed, we talked about this a little bit. It always bears motion. The rule of thumb is the shutter speed should be double the frames per second. So that's another thing that you should be looking to do when you go into that menu system and you're looking to figure out what type of footage you want to hit. So for example, if you're shooting at 24 frames progressive frames per second, your shutter speed should be at 1 50th of a second. If you're shooting at 30 frames progressive, it's 1 60th of a second. And if it's 60th, 60 frames per second, it should be one one twentieth of a second. So it's not that hard to remember, but if you, it, 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 it certainly helps when you just kind of keep going through it in your head over and over for a little bit to just kind of burn it in there to ingrain it in your consciousness so that you know what you're looking for because that has absolutely nothing to do with the still image. <laughs> so for those of you that you're using and have had broad history of this, of still imaging, this, that's where this is going to come into play. And that's, those are one of the things that you can kind of, that can bite you sometimes. And obviously for fire frame rates at 120 frames per second, um, or 240 or even 960, obviously you're going to be using higher shutter speed. And this allows for sharper frames for slow motion playback. If you're going to be doing time, you know, at, at all types of things, especially you want, because when you're talking about progressing like 30 frames and 60 frames, you're basically looking for more cohesive motion. Okay. And we'll be talking about that too. Uh, just as a still reference, I just want to back this up just as far as what you're looking at as far as from a shutter speed standpoint, just so we can get on the same page here. You know, you see there's 50th of a second. That's exactly, especially with running water. <clears throat> that's at 24 frames a second. You're going to be clicking out a lot more than just a still image. So you're, it's going to be skipping, but you're still going to be getting that type of motion that things are going to be going back and forth together. It's almost like a book. So it's like a flip book. So the more frames provide, much smoother moment. And um, this is just kind of illustrates. I don't think this is a movie though. So no, it's not, but this is. So let me just show you here real quick. This is kind of an example of slow motion. We showed this last week. And on the left is a split screen for S-Log to kind of show you what a flat camera curve looks like versus kind of something that's graded in midday sun that's kind of, you know, but it's, it's really detail oriented. So 
you can kind of see everything is kind of smooth. So in a post-production editor, when you're moving your slider around and you're, you're scrubbing around video, everything is going to be a lot smoother, a lot more detailed. It's going to be a lot more fine, but also obviously it takes up more space can sometimes be a little bit of touch more compressed just because it is a ton of data. But again, we're going to be going to this more in another class. Let me just get this along here if I can. Okay. Whoop. Sorry. There we go. The other thing we talked about a little bit, but we didn't really show a lot of it is rolling shutter. So Vanny, why don't you go into this a little bit? Cause I, I think, you so know, we both kind of talked about a little bit. Sensors read out data from top to bottom. That's a rolling shutter. A global shutter is a sensor that reads the entire sensor. It refreshes it with every frame. A rolling shutter is what most CMOS sensors are. Sony's any other brand. It's since it goes from top to bottom, if you're panning left to right or you're seeing hel helicopter blades, they look a little funky. Yeah, so how many cameras, Manny, how many interchangeable lens still cameras have a global shutter? Uh, High-end cinema cameras. Nice. No, I mean, I, that's what I was, I was trying to, I was trying to say. Like, say like, just say zero. 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 Oh, big donuts. Yeah. Big yeah. donut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Because honestly, if you powered that on like one of the bodies of like, for example, an a, you know, Ace, anybody, Canon, food, Sony, anything, you'd be able to fry eggs in a few seconds because of the heat generated off of that. Now, however, we do have a highly reduced rolling chart technology. So you can see it is stuttering a bit, but basically what we're trying to do is I'm trying to jitter and try to make any type of distortion or any type of these edges kind of blend in the image to make it look like almost like, oh my God, there's, a, you know, helicopter blades bending and things like that, or a golf, a golf swing or a bat, you know, baseball bat. So our technology certainly has surpassed a lot of the other manufacturers in regards to rolling shutter, be tricking, trickling down the reduction of rolling shutter, trickling down to internet, uh, like mirrorless ILC cameras, so interchangeable lens cameras, and that's 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 important. To, that's important to focus on. Um, I'm gonna actually hold on a second here. This uh, let's see, give me a second. I'm gonna turn this volume down because this clip actually does have volume. Transition speed. When we mention transition speeds, this is gonna be talking about focus. So when we talk about having a focusing and then transition speed here, it kind of gives a little bit of a cinematic narrative, like trying to trick, trying to tell you, okay, this is where your focus should be. This is where you're kind of, especially if you're, you know, off center subjects and everything like that, but it can be dramatic. It can be abrupt uh, when certain events happen in film and, and, and cinema. So it, it, this is what we'll be talking with transition speed because it's becoming more of a big player with a lot of ILCs and mirrorless systems. Image stabilizer. This is kind of almost the bread butter feature. I'm sorry. Actually, right. Manny, I want Manny so, to talk about Gene, the next chapter. Yeah, uh, no, exactly. image stabilization. <laughs> yes, sir. So this is uh, something that uh, Sony pretty much pioneered in the mirrorless space. Uh, image stabilization is a great feature for people who drink a lot of coffee like me. Uh, if you have a small camera, with even a small lens or even a large lens, your handshake will always be pronounced. You need weight for that. So Sony does that with by actually shifting the sensor with its own accelerometers and gyros. It's a five axis image stabilization. Gene? Yeah, it's a five axis stabilization, just like you see on the screen. Um, unless you have an A7S III, it is five and a half stops. <laughs> you know, so we actually have an added half stop there. And on top of that, we also have an active IS feature, which crops the 4K footage just a little bit, but we're gonna show you here in a second exactly, kind of on the left-hand side, the A7 III, this is a standard model image stabilizer from the A7S III. On the right-hand side is the active st stabilizer. So basically what that is, the active mode is certainly kind of acting more like a gimbal. <laughs> you know, it is definitely to, like for your DJI Ronin or insert off-brand names. So it's, it's tracking a lot better. Um, we've extensively field tested this and it is just awesome because the, the autofocus, which we're also gonna talk about here soon, is absolutely stunning and spot on, especially on your, your proprietary Sony lens. So it, this mode, I mean, certainly is, is tackling and looking to save you a little bit more money, especially if you're running and gunning it and you're not you know, a big onset entrepreneur or anything like that where you, you need a lot of gear. This is for those type of shooters that need something on the fly that's gonna be professional use that you're gonna be able to use for broadcast 
and you can do it all by hand. And yes, just like uh, Manny said, we're both VIP members of the local coffee. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> and, uh, I was trying to think, who's, what side shop you're next to? Brooklyn Roasting. Brooklyn Roast, yeah, Brooklyn Roast. We're both Brooklyn Roast VIP. So, but again, with the AI, if you can, ch if you can look, um, there is a slight crop on yes. the active AI versus the full image. So if you need the full 4K readout, you're definitely not going to so miss that. It's so giving you a, a slight crop because it's using the extra room around the frame to try to create its own um, stabilization effect. It needs that extra data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thanks a lot for talking about the weight because that obviously that is something that has a lot to do with it because you need to compensate. Well, people can say, oh, well, if it's lighter weight, it's going to be easier to stabilize. And that's oh. absolutely not true. <laughs> you know, that's why you do with a lot of counterweight systems to kind of give it a little bit more girth and a lot of more control. All right. What you see is what you get and the joy of the EVF. <laughs> so people who come from a previous video background are used to using a giant electronic viewfinder with an iCup or they're using a monitor. Once you switch over to a DSLR, you didn't have that option. You had to use the back of the screen. With a mirrorless camera, you have the best of both worlds. Yeah, uh, what you see is what you get on a viewfinder. For me, it has been the most satisfying thing about using a mirrorless system. I mean, the joy of me not having to meter everything where I can pretty much, and believe me, I mean, early on, I mean, I think the viewfinders you know, I don't think anything's a perfect science, but being able to see that image come out right where you want it, you know, it, it, I think it gives a little bit more joy to the composition, a little bit more, I feel more connected to shooting, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> just because I look at it, it works in almost no light, we have sunny settings, so we have so many different ways that you can see what you want, and you can even turn your live, your, your EVF uh, live view display setting off in case you're using strobes or any type of constantly, you know, certain lights that you need to meter, and, and check just what your ambient is. Now, I'm gonna show you here kind of what it means to how you can change up the display because this sample that's being shown right here is, I think what, I think Manny, you and I both agree, it's pretty damn messy. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I, can barely, <laughs> I cannot tell what is going on. So I, I definitely keep my, my setting a little bit uh, simple. Oops, sorry, let me, I didn't mean to wake everybody up there. Um, let's go over here. So in order to change it up a little bit, so this is gen this is based on third generation menu systems, but the other menu systems from Pry version also have this. It's just gonna be in a different type of location, but typically in the newer, it's gonna be in camera menu two uh, towards the middle of the pack there. So you can pick exactly what you wanna see or you don't see. You can even pick exactly if you wanna use your monitor or your finder. I think what people misjudge about our systems, and even from a video standpoint, is that the EVF actually draws some more power than the back LCD. So people think, yeah, oh, I have to turn the LCD off. I'm like, no, nah, if you really want to save some battery life, you're going to be turning off that EVF because that has taken up a lot more juice. But you're going to be able to change just using tick boxes, check boxes, exactly what information you really want to do. And usually for for my, uh, I, I, I'm very easy. I mean, anybody that texts with me or anything like that or that helps me out with my systems or anything, all I want to see is a histogram. That, that, that's really just, just basically about it. Um, so this is the back of my camera that I actually shot this this morning. <laughs> so it just, I would have, and you're looking at my messy gear closet. Thank you. I originally really wish I could have found a better subject. I actually just point shot and set it over because I was like, I gotta get this presentation. So it's kind of bootleg, but that is exactly what you see on mine. So in the lower right hand corner is a histogram. And maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. So a histogram uh, measures and shows you in, in a visual way, your light values, your light, your, your, your shadows, your midtones, and your highlights. Left is your shadows, the midtones are in the middle, and your highlights are on the right. You don't want to, pe to clip your highlights. Or right. the shadows. Or the shadows, yeah, exactly. And usually, you know, in video, what I'll do is I will overexpose at least a stop, you know, just to, because to be on the safe side, because a lot of the grain and details are in the shadows. So you want to make sure that you can kind of keep, so the, you want to keep the blacks black and you don't want to have a burnout, you don't want any color noise going on in there. So that's why with the rule of thumb with video is, and that, that means kind of exposing to the right a little bit. Yeah, you want to make sure, and this also <laughs> helps you when you're shooting log. 
Yes, it's exactly when you're shooting the lock. <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> when you're shooting lock. Now, when you have that LUT, when we talk about like that gamma display assist, which we mentioned a little bit last week, which is that Rex, that basically a broadcast profile that gives you a little bit more of an indicator and a detailed or, you know, or, or it's more detail oriented as far as how, where you are in the pack. But also that's where that histogram is because you know, especially after you've graded a little bit footage, you know what sits where, like Manny said, you know, the blacks, the, the mid-tones and the highlights to see what you need to crunch, what, where your S curve is going to go because obviously every scene is going to be different, especially have more highlights and shadows and vice versa. Which leads us to our next thing is white balance. balance. Yes. <laughs> Talk to us about white balance, man. Uh, white balance is for anyone who cares about accurate color. This is how you basically set it up so that someone who has you know, light brown skin doesn't look like a green Martian alien. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Man, I'm glad you said that too, because <laughs> because we I think, you know, I think a lot of people with the Sony system, I mean in particular, just like, well, I'm you know, especially if you're used to using, like, I know Canon out of the box, you know, the skin tones are like, okay, that's where I kind of want to be. Yeah. I think our sensors, we tend to, with the dynamic range, with the expand dynamic range, you kind of have to pick what you want and you can just dial it in a little bit. Now, on the a7 III, the a7S III, the color science for skin tones is remarkable. <laughs> I mean, that camera, those cameras really start to shine naturally. But in any case, I always, 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 I take one of these X-ray color checkers at, so I can program in a custom color temperature, just especially if I'm using multi-cameras, because if you're using different types of cameras, they're going to read things certain different. So I highly encourage, if you cannot go to PhotoK right now and get a gray card, so Go get a color checker is. chart. Yeah, get the X-ray <laughs> color checker there too, because that'll be well worth your money. It's yeah. it's been a saving grace for me on, on a lot of my shoots. And what you do is you basically hold this color checker up right in front. You start shooting. You know, you don't just mark your color balance. You shoot. So in post production, you can just take your color picker right there and wherever you want with those different shades, you'll be able to pick each footage, each shot you have. And, and color and, and grade it right there. And it, it just makes, it's a time saver. Yeah, most of uh, video editing software, Premiere and um, DaVinci Resolve, they natively read color checker cards to create a yes, profile. Sir. Yep, yep. I see we actually, uh, before I forget, do we, I have one question here. Yeah, so um, Kaminsky is asking, and this is from when you were talking about rolling shutter. Right. Why is the, the effect more pronounced on silent shutter? So I'm thinking he's talking about silent shutter in photography mode. Yep. So it's exactly what it's exactly what Manny said. <laughs> if you're listening to what he said, the shutter because basically you have no physical shutter. So you have a sensor that pops on, it's reading data top to bottom. Mm -hmm. So that's where banding comes in. And I think that may be what you're referring to, that and certain cameras that the banding, like if you have different lights pulsing. So say for example, you're in a really dimly lit place and it's kind of crappy light, you want to make sure that you set your shutter. I default mine to about 60th of a second for 60 cycle hum. So it's pulsing with it. Now you do have a feature on the newer cameras, especially the, Sony, the, the new Sony mirrorless cameras where basically it's reading the lights right now and it's dictating when to fire the shutter to reduce any type of rolling shutter effect. So on the newer systems, that actually has it built in. But some of the earlier versions, that's kind of the way to play it safe or if you have, if you're shooting speakers, I mean, I'm, I mean, people like myself or Manny, for example, and you're on stage or something and they ha they're, you know, they have a LCD behind them or anything like that or a type of slide display projection. And then the, basically you have to roll out at 60 seconds because it's pulsing. And if it doesn't, you'll get a lot of just weird stuff behind it. So here we have a list of a lot of the white balances that you can choose. Most of us, especially in video, are going to go for Kelvin or a custom white balance setting. Uh, to go ahead and set it, basically, you just have to, it's really easy for those of you who have Sony cameras, you can go right into your function menu button, you can go into your white balance set, scroll all the way down, and you can either choose by moving over to the right on a, on a Kelvin tab, you can choose and choose whatever color temperature you want, if you want 4,500, if you want 5,500, or you can make a custom one where it'll basically say you can, if you can hold up a gray card, and on the center, right in the center of the screen, just hit that center button rear dial on the back of your camera, and it's gonna basically set the white balance for you, depending on what lights you have. <clears throat> so again, yeah, you know, like I said here, you can go in here, you can set everything, and yeah. you know, use your dial, there's your center button. It's just real easy. Rule of thumb, when you're shooting in mixed light environments, find your key light. Find the most dominant light in the scene and balance for that. And if you're any secondary lights, 
if you can and have the time and the budget, jell them. <laughs> jell them, yeah, exactly. CTO, <laughs> yeah, CTO. <laughs> As your friend, Kelly Temperature yeah. Orange. All right, go ahead, mate. All right, Next chapter. So, so if you're like me, you shoot a lot of people. Uh, if you have multiple cameras, you still have to match the skin tone because every camera interprets it a little different. But if you're shooting across the Sony line, it's pretty even, but you still got to match your skin tones. Yep. So get away, yep. Gene. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad you said what you said earlier about the skin tones. So this morning, before I shaved my beard off, I, yeah, I look really happy here. This is basically me. That's my seven-year-old son downstairs who was studying. Actually, I think he probably just stopped. So I went down and popped off a frame of him because obviously we have different skin tones and this is the standard profile. A lot of people want to know how to get more natural skin tone or more contrasty skin tones, I, I guess you should say, because to me, actually, that does look pretty okay. I'm like, wow, okay, I don't, I'm not, I don't have a problem with it. Um, but some people do. And so I, I, I take something that we did with uh, NBC News and Dateline is that they have a lot of Canon cinema cameras and they did match their A7S2s to those cinema cameras. So in order to do that, we used something called Autumn Leaves. <laughs> so Autumn Leaves is a little bit more red driven. It is more contrasty, it's more, so this is what I think when I think of Canon. So yeah. I would be using this type of color tone. You can also use it in video. So they do use this in video for Dateline cuts, uh, for B cams, for their skin tones to match with their Canon Cine series. So remember, this isn't the only way to do it. I mean, there are other ways that you can get in and you can customize and you can tweak your white balances and creative styles to taste, but it's all about taking those rules and kind of breaking them, you know, <laughs> breaking them apart. You don't have to just dictate white balance. Because remember, on these new creative styles, especially on A7S III, you're going to be able to tweak the saturation, contrast levels, high ends, shadows, everything about that image. You're going to be able you're going to be able to touch on that, including the color palette, so that you're going to be able to use it. Awesome. All right. So this is a question that I get a lot. <laughs> yeah. Camera counter, because it's uh, it's a pretty in depth <laughs> menu, <laughs> but yeah. it's one of the most useful things you can do as a video shooter, and that is set up your memory recall. That's what MR on the dial stands for. Gene, break yeah. it down for me, please. Yeah. So essentially, when you look at the top of the dial, you have either one, two, or one, two, and three. <laughs> you know, and basically, like, what the heck is that? Yeah. So that is memory recall. And by the way, this is a shameless plug. You can check out a really in depth video of this on my YouTube channel. So just check it out. But basically, the parameters are that you can take any stick of settings. There's a dial right there in the lower left hand side. And you can pretty much program any choices you want that you're gonna be able to choose for one, two, or three, or in some cases, one and two. I normally default my number one always to, excuse me, 30 frames per second progressive. So I will be changing out my camera as such, you know, to like a 50th of a second shutter speed. I'll be changing it for uh, probably about f-stop four or five. Just go ahead and put all that in your camera system, ISO 400. Uh, creative style standard, focusing wide. And basically what you're gonna be able to do is to go to that first page or two of your menu. I'm sorry, I'm actually, I'm like, well, I don't know why I just popped on the A7S3 because it's a totally different menu, but there it is anyway. And you're gonna be able to, in page one or two, it's gonna say MR and you're gonna be able to go in there and you're just gonna hit the enter button on whatever one, if you want it in one, two or three, and you're gonna be able to save those settings so that no matter what, whenever you hit one, two, or three, those settings are going to be memorized. So remember for video, what I would do is you put that little white dot in that top dial right on the film strip, because that's the movie mode. You do not want to be shooting in still mode. You want to make sure that your frame rate and your shutter speed or circuit hold, they're, they're properly set. Your aperture is properly set. We want, if you want it in wide and shallow depth of field, because you do a lot of interviews in small rooms or with really not too great backgrounds, and, and you want to make it look perfect. Now, obviously, if you're using a green screen, that might be a little bit of a different setup. Uh, if you are using wide focus, for some of you, if you're using cinema zooms that or cine primes that are all manual focus, make sure it's in manual focus. Um, make sure your picture profile, if you want it in S-Log, that that's going to be on. So if you're going to be using S, you know, Cine 4, S-Log 2, S-Log 3, or HDR, whatever your hyper gamma, make sure that's always in there. And then you can basically just hit that at any time, whether or not you're doing stills or even doing video in another type of uh, application. And, go, and it's going to go right back to where it was supposed to be. You so know? The, way, the way I like to see it is I'm a visual person. Like I'm 
I'm sure you all are. Uh, I see number one, that's going to be uh, interview mode. Number two, uh, high speed uh, SQ mode. So if I want to shoot some slow motion B-roll, I go to number two. If I want something similar to like a macro for video, go to number three. Each one, two, and three, each one will have their own settings and it'll, it'll always remember it. Always. Now, and for me, like I take my camera out a lot of places. So a lot of people change all my settings. So yeah. in order for me to, in order for me to get ready, especially I'm gigging and I'm gigging. Guilty as charged. I'm, yeah, I'm getting a Soga <laughs> camera. I have to program my own way so that I know that I can just go into it and I can pick a camera out of my case and go to one because all of my cameras are programmed the same way like that. So that's just a little bit of a tip. And a lot of people get kind of, they're very hesitant, like, wow, memory recall. But you have all of these different choices in here if you want to put peaking on. Uh, a lot of things, the histogram, a lot of the way that your viewfinder is set up. Now, if you're lucky enough to have an A7S III or will have an A7S III shortly, you are going to be able to take all of your video settings are going to be in two different menus. You know, your, your stills are going to be in one set and your video is going to be in others. So you're going to have a whole different at a landscape to operate off of. So if you want to do interview setup or you want to do run and gun news, or if you want to do sports or high speed recording, you're going to be able to set all that other fun stuff up. So it's really super useful. <clears throat> Yay. So oh yeah, autofocus modes, something that Sony has pretty much pioneered in this space. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. It has it's probably one of the most in-depth and, com and complex, but very useful autofocus modes for every <laughs> setting possible. Yes. Uh, Gene? <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, we're looking at it right now. So basically, you, you operate on a few principles. The wide area of focus is going to focus on the object that's most close to the camera. You're going to have a three-zone focus, so you can take your, your whole screen and divide it into thirds. You also have your center point focus, and you have your flexible spot focus. So your flexible spot focus, luckily, if you have that little joystick on the back of your camera, you're going to be able to take that and float around any part of the screen, or you can, a lot of some of these cameras now, you can touch focus and touch right on it and uh, get to the point you want to be. And you can also you get to a tracking standpoint. So like we said, with the wide area of focus, it's going to be going to the object that's closest. With the zone, you're going to be taken up. It's going to be moving around. And on the center point, keep it simple. Everything in the center. Flexible spot, it's whatever you desire. And we move into what's known as face detection. Yes. One of my favorite features is, person, is a person who shoots people. Um, if you're shooting wide open, <laughs> on like a 50 1.4 face detection will be your best friend especially if you're shooting video while someone's walking away from you and then turning around and moving you know, right back to you you'll be surprised how good the sony the autofocus face detection is correct yeah and obviously what we're doing is we're using a special ai algorithm that memorizes faces so it memorizes noses eyes lips shapes, ears, everything like that. And you can even register those faces. So if those are going to be a priority, that they will be able to pick out of a crowd <laughs> on any given way. So with AF on faces, with the ability to set priority and register faces and face registration is good. And then usually it's more useful for weddings and family events, but I also know a lot of people that do a lot of portraits and event and entertainment photography that do it, that they just program everything in there that they can automatically really, it, it, it takes the guessing game out of it and they know that your camera is going to be locked on. Setting a priority specifically for the bride or the groom. Yeah, exactly. But, and you know who wins on that one? The bride, always. <laughs> All right, autofocus drive speed during movies. Yes. So you can set it to be either very snappy or very slow and cinematic. Yeah, like we talked about with the 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 t what I what you said there was actually my that clip of my daughter and one of my good friends artist Vincent Zabrano before mentioned there, um, you can take you have different levels so you have one through seven especially in A7S three on the other cameras you have about three or four speeds which is fast standard slow so you can make sure that if you want it to be a little bit more of a narrative on, and, and not as punchy like in the news standpoint like camcorders tend to do where it's like whoop gotta jump to this subject whoop there's this one. It takes a much more smooth approach to it, to your footage, to make it a little bit more professional looking. Mm -hmm. And that's that's something that kind of has trickled down from the cinema series. And what, what believe it or not, it's actually one of the features that people love most about these cameras now, is that you can dictate the speed. You can actually even dictate the subject, whatever subject you're going to, and the speed that they're going to be going on.
Yeah, you don't want your autofocus uh, just like, snapping onto somebody if you're trying to shoot something cinematic. It, it's very jarring. Right. And which was kind of what we're looking at here. That's more faster approach. You know, whereas, you know, if you, if you want to go into normal speed, let's go let's see here. Let's go ahead. Let's go on. Sorry, I got, I think I got tripped up. There we go. Here's the normal speed. See, it's a little bit slower and yeah. likewise it's going back and then we're going to be basically looking at going more towards the slow, but again, so especially if you're using off-center subjects. Oh, I'm sorry. What was that? It looks a lot more natural. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more smooth. Yeah. So here when we go to smooth, you get a little bit more of a dramatic flair. So especially yeah. when people are having a conversation and there's something saying something very important, especially in a scene, it, it, using a slow momentum kind of helps out show reactionary. Oh, well, auto tracking sensitivity. <laughs> yeah, well, fun, fun, fun. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Like, woohoo. <laughs> So this is another side, you know, another thing that people ask about a lot as far as, you know, is <clears throat> as far as the tracking sensitivity. So like, boom, 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 how fast the subjects go on. Look at that. Yeah. So that, that goes, you know, you get to more of a responsive nature. It's going to suck up the battery a little bit more just yeah. because it's really overclocking the processor, but it's giving you an area that's basically can be looked at, especially, you know, if you have a properly set up, obviously you want to be on AFC, so that, you know, wherever your focus point goes automatically, it is going to go unless, you know, because on AFS, it's just going to stay, <laughs> you know, it's just going to stay as a single object and so continuously focusing. All right. But those are certain tools that you kind of want to get to know there yeah, you in regards to the focusing, because I yeah. think that that's a lot of the, that's a lot of hindrance for people, especially photographers moving into videography as far as what they should do as far as setting up. Yeah. I mean, uh, for us, yeah, for, go ahead. Go ahead. What that's were you a, that's say? actually a perfect segue into extending battery life because autofocus does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, 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 definitely, definitely. <laughs> AFS, if you, uh, if you want to do that with an AF single yes. shot. Well, you want to uh, save battery the most, go on manual focus. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, <laughs> when, you're in, when you're in video and it, when you're shooting video, your camera's going to be on a lot more. For me, for example, as a, as, as an editorial photography, when I'm talking to people or subjects or I'm just stopping shooting, I notoriously now just always program my finger to always turn off the camera. It is always going off. Obviously in video, it's not going to be the same case. So in regards to extending battery life, you want to make sure that the camera is defaulting, that the airplane mode is off. You want to make sure that it's on so it's not always looking for wireless, wireless networks to go ahead and clock into. You're also going to make sure that your pre-AF roll is off because basically what that means is the camera line that's by your side, no matter the focusing mode is that it's always going to be trying to focus on something, <laughs> you know, even, you know, if it's your shoe, whatever. And then basically using a quality to stay a, a display quality of standard. Um, honestly, that in itself uh, makes me, um, it, 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 for example, yesterday I was, I was using a camera for the first time that I had, that I'd taken out to the beach and it was set to a sunny weather display. And when you're at a sunny weather display, you're getting a very bright viewfinder. And that nothing will suck a battery like that, not to mention show you an image that you will not be getting off the camera, especially if you're shooting indoors. But hitting on standard, that always makes me, whenever I go in this mode, I, I always make sure that not only am I in a standard quality, but that my monitor is always set up properly and that the power start, save start time is set to about a minute and not like an hour or something like that. Like so that, you know, if you are not using it, it is automatically going to clock down. All right. Uh, Pre-AF is something that it can be useful if you're shooting wildlife. Um, I tend to turn it off because it drains battery so fast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There you go. And then, yeah, obviously those are your friends and mine. Those are the battery bricks that are very helpful to us. Now we actually have a nice quad charger for us, 100 batteries mm -hmm. that you can charge up four batteries and basically power a camera for about two days. Yeah. But in case that's you wanted something a little bit more portable, you can absolutely <laughs> use. Actually, Sony has new uh, USB battery charger packs coming out uh, that you'll be able to roll out right into your camera via the USB ports, and then oh, nice. you'll be able to charge out. So, yeah, it's very useful and very portable. Uh, people actually have been doing this probably since the A7 II <laughs> series, yeah. so it's been pretty easy. You know, it's people have been bootlegging this. You'll see people running around with, like, extension cords running around their pockets. So it's probably not the safest way to do it, but... 
but it, it certainly gives me yeah. a chuckle. It shows whenever I see that. Well, whenever I'm shooting a wedding, I'm like the main camera, like down the, the fuse. I strap a, one of those big battery banks, strap it to the tri- tripod leg, I run a USB cord to the camera, just let it run the whole, the whole ceremony. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. All right. Wait a minute. Let's see your okay. custom keys. All right. This is where we're going to probably run down because I know that we are running out of town. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, know, I, was looking, I was looking at the time there. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. So the custom keys are very important. Your camera is about as automatic and as manual as you really want it to be. Uh, before I f- jump into this, if you have any more questions, please do share. Yeah, we have no questions at the moment. So yeah. Yep. So setting up the control wheel and is something I don't normally do. Uh, some people do, but basically you can change every single thing to about 67 different options for each button. And some cameras are gonna have anywhere between three to five different type of customizable buttons, including one or not to include one that may be on the side of your lens. So ba- so if you wanna change anything to re- reflect where you want your white balance, your ISO, and you, anything that's gonna help you out from a video standpoint, your focusing modes, you're going to be able to change all of that. So if you need autofocus and it's set to wide area face detection, and then you immediately want to go to a manual focus so that you can take a more a narrative approach and a, and a more severity look to your stuff, that's where you can be changing things right on the fly really quick. So your camera really isn't going to be set up like anybody else's. <clears throat> Excuse me about that. Uh, <laughs> Real quick, I just ran. I just got something that totally caught my throat. Do you want to add anything on that one, Manny? Uh, I think we're nearing the end of the. the yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah. I think <laughs> we're pretty good. So hold on, yeah. let me just stop out there. But really, thanks a lot, everyone, for everyone for coming out. And next week, we're going to be diving down the rabbit hole a little bit more, um, and exploring S and Q motions. So we're going to try to do exp- explore some high speed frame rates, and pretty much yeah. I'm going to try to put some stuff in that may not look very sexy, and try to make it look sexy and see if it works. Yeah, everyone, just uh, please make sure to go to photocares.com's uh, events page and please sign up. And when you do sign up, make sure to, to answer the questionnaire so that we, we know exactly what questions to, you know, to, you know, to bring up because uh, we actually, actually helped a lot with today's webinar. <laughs> yeah, a lot of these slides and everything that were put together were put together because you asked these questions. So we need to keep asking them and keep us in, informed and then right. give us feedback and show us what, what else we need to put together to make you a better videographer. So with that being said, uh, if you missed any part of any previous webinar, if you go to photocares, uh, photocare.com and then go to the videos tab, takes us to our YouTube channel. Every webinar we've ever recorded will be on there, including last week's. So please make sure to watch, like, and subscribe. Great. Right. Thank you guys thank very you much. Too. It's good to have a good rest of the week, okay? Yeah. Great questions, everyone. Have yeah, good, thank you. And have a good rest of the week. See you. Bye. Okay, bye.